Thank you, and thank you for the invitation today. Hello, Wikimania. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Um, I'm going to run through an emergent idea today, software as a public service, um, which is highly appropriate, I think, for, for all Wikipedians and all followers of open data. Um, though I don't think there'll be too much time for questions at the end, but I'm going to try and go really quickly. It's an odd question. I'll try and take that if we have time. So let's get to it. Can I just ask first, um, who has, seen, has anyone here seen me speak before? Unfortunately, had the pleasure. Right, not too many. Okay, the old jokes will work then, smashing. Okay, uh, I'm Mike Bracken. I run the uh, government's digital service. Uh, it's this place, it's full of people like this. And um, at heart, we're a, a team of government, a team in the center of government who builds services focused on users. Uh, that's unique, pretty much, around the world. Governments generally don't do this. They don't put teams of people like us at the heart of government. So I really want to talk to you about today why, what we've been doing, but also the ethos behind that. I think it's shared with many of you here today. Um, we have a culture of openness, openness around tools, around data, and around software. And I will come to talk to that, that openness, and how we got here. But first, there's quite a bit of exposition. And let me just give you a little bit of history about how we started. We started in 2011, um, and Martha Lane Fox, the then digital champion, who is an incredible backer and supporter of us, wrote a series of letters to Francis Maud, the Minister of the Cabinet Office, and they came up with a report, which I took part in, called Revolution Not Evolution, Digital by Default. And if you boil the report down, it's quite slim, it's worth reading, you can boil it down to four things. These are the four things you've got to do. Create GDS, create a digital center of government in the... Uh, as I say, in the heart of government. Fix publishing. Make government look like government every time you use it and start talking to people and having a conversation with people rather than broadcasting out with lots of different brands. Then fix transactions. That's how people deal with government. We have a bewildering number of those. And finally, go wholesale, which is take this data out and let's all take part using it and creating new services with it. So that's the strategy. It's disarmingly simple. Doing it is less disarmingly simple. Uh, we do an awful lot of things at GDS, and mercifully for you, I'm not going to talk about any of those today. We do have six main programs. The first is gov.uk. Has anyone used gov.uk? Great. Your favorite website, apart from Wikipedia, obviously. Um, that's a platform for government. The next is identity. We're rolling that out at the moment. So you can use some of your own identities to deal with government. It fundamentally changes the relationship between the state, the individual, and businesses. I also run technology for government. I'm going to try and give people kit, a bit like this, so they can get their job done. More importantly, measurement and analytics, giving people data about services. Our performance platform is the start of that. If you go to gov.uk forward slash performance, you can see that now. Fifth is capability, getting more people into government, both as employees, contractors, working with different types of suppliers, vastly widening our skills base. And probably most importantly at the moment, 25 of the most important transactions in government. They include things like registering to vote, motoring services, claims, civil courts, tax, health, wealth, uh, tax and benefits. So we're transforming those uh, at the same time. That's full end-to-end -end transformation of 25 of the biggest services. There are major platforms, uh, sorry, our major projects of work. I want to talk a little bit about them and what transformation looks like. Because when we talk about applying things like open data and open access into government, People generally, I think, have a rosy view of what government looks like. Who here has worked in central government? Well, a few people. And you'll know we have a, a fine collection of Victoriana and neo-Baroque monstrosities in which we have to work. Because government looks a bit like this. It is a long, long way from being sexy for those of you who've worked in different buildings and different industries. And actually what we're doing at the moment is taking often a Victorian legacy or certainly a post-war legacy of physical infrastructure and making it digital, making services like these. 
and making the organizations think of themselves as a digital service rather than as a big physical structure. That is a profound culture change, and that's why we have to be open. So we don't really focus on the big sort of political intrigue or the big policy of the day. We focus on getting stuff done, and particularly transactions, because we have a very strong belief that it's services that we should um, concentrate on, and it's delivery of services. People's relationships with government is often not political. It's just stuff you want to get done, stuff like this, booking a driving test, paying for your tax, all of this stuff. Because every single time people deal with government and this stuff doesn't work or is suboptimal, it costs a lot of money. It costs people money, it costs people time, it costs government an astonishing amount of money, and government's money is your money. So we're part of a group that saved that uh, amount of money last year, or to put that roughly, that's 1% of GDP. So that's... <laughs> I will take that applause on behalf of the hundreds of people who have been carving that money out for the last year, none of whom get to stand on this stage saying this stuff. So um, there's the big, big picture. So how do we do all this? Now, there's a lot of stuff behind all this, obviously, and there's a theme to today. I want to talk about software as a public service. Um, I'm going to really talk about three approaches and three issues that we've learnt in this journey so far, but I'm more than happy to take questions and talk about anything else. The first approach and the first things that we have learned, and it, it, you can never say it enough, is starting with user needs. This is a little uh, device we have on the windows in our offices. Uh, it's a bit of tracing paper with a bit ripped out, just to remind us if we ever forget about why we go to work, who's paying our wages, and who we should be focused on. Um, it's our first design principle is to focus on user needs. So why do we have to say that? Why is a man on stage telling you that the government's focused on user needs? Well, actually, the reason we do that is like many large organizations, we haven't been on focused on users for a very, very long time. We've been focused on ourselves and on policy and on our manner of infighting and our manner of supplier relationships, but we've often forgotten the poor people who have to use these services at the end of the day. And digital transformation gives us an opportunity to address that. Um, we built GovUK literally from the ground up with those cards by putting around on the floor and on the walls all the needs of government that users had and then grading them and putting them to some sort of hierarchy and structure and going at the big ones first. Because it plays a part in everything that we do. These are our colleagues in Ministry of Justice who are starting through this now. They've got a great view out of their window, Buckingham Palace with royalty and the rest of them have users. So the first message is user needs. The second thing is a relentless unapologetic focus on delivery. The strategy is and always will be delivery. It is so important to focus on the outcomes and getting stuff done quickly. This is a poster in my office, that's Russell Davis in our office, and the reason that poster went up was I was so sick and tired of people going in, coming in saying, well, I've, I've got all these PowerPoint slides, and I've got this plan, I'm gonna do a, a procurement, and in a couple of years we'll have this thing. It's like, just show the thing, because it's so easy now to create stuff that users want to see, uh, and it's actually more important to do it quickly and iteratively than it is to a giant plan to invent the future because the future comes around so quickly. Well, put it this way, this is a guy called Simon Willison who I had the pleasure of working with briefly um, a few years ago when I was at The Guardian. And, you know, Simon famously said this, you can now build working software in less time than it takes to have the meeting to describe it. I've been to many government meetings. He's not wrong. But the critical thing about this style and structure is to recognize there's no reason government can't be and shouldn't be good at technology. Um, our version of what we're doing now, which might seem unusual for a government, is actually rooted in a deep-seated legacy of how government works in this country. This is one of the slides where I say, do you know who this man is? And you say, no. Um, this is a man called James Brindley. And he set a precedent in the UK some time ago. If anyone, anyone know Brindley? Social history? What's the word associated with Brindley? Canals, correct. Well, it is Brindley, it is Canals. 
And James Rooney famously built canals, which actually were the sort of infrastructure behind the growth of the Industrial Revolution in the Northwest. But what Brindley realised, he's a terrific engineer, and I can't do justice here, but what he realised is a lot of this stuff was already built. He actually linked them up astonishingly well. He networked what was already there, or you could call it, he joined small pieces loosely joined, and what Brindley did was create a system from the pieces that were already there. We have similar models of large-scale civic infrastructure in the UK. This man is William James Bazalgette, and he was the head of the Metropolitan Board of Works in the 1860s. His job was to fight cholera in this city. And what he designed was a sewer system, another amazing piece of civic infrastructure, but he designed vast, vast capacity, and it powers this city to this day and has led to the growth of London in the last 150 years, or you could call it a series of tubes. And he built this huge capacity, but a bit like Brinley, but even more so, he realised something about civic infrastructure. It, of course, has got to be useful. That's what infrastructure is for. But it also has to be beautiful. This is a place called Crossness, which is in the southeast of London. It's not annually that way. And it's one of the pumping houses. And when he built this, it's not entirely a folly, but it's not far off. It's a pumping station. There's some pumps for the, for the sewers. And, but people used to go for a day trip and go, oh, look, isn't that on the sewers? Lovely. Because you can't go and look at a sewer. You can do it. No one wants to. So he's had a day trip. The Prince Regent famously had dinner here. But the point about it is you recognize that civic infrastructure needs to be beautiful. So those messages that you can join up pieces, you can, small pieces loosely joined of stuff that's already there, and you can go for massive capacity that has beauty, underpin what we do now. And to, un to understand that in a digital age, and to follow the patterns already set, that design pattern that Brindley and Bazalgette left us, one needs government employees who can understand technology, but also who can speak to power and deliver services and enable innovation. Because civic infrastructure gets made on the ground, and that's something that this man understood, and it's people, all the people who build Wikipedia understand, is that the infrastructure itself and the data within it is done at the point closest to the user. Because we have a view that democracy, in a wider sense, and in a digital sense, isn't undermined by a failure of ideas. Of course, there are democratic ideas all the time in the news, some successful, some not. But it's this constant drip, drip, drip of inadequate services. That's what democracy looks and feels like to someone who is using a public service. We bake that straight into our thinking. This is lasting powers of attorney, one of the first services. Has anyone used this? Lasting powers of attorney, how was it? When did you use it? This year, last year? Yeah, yeah. This year. Ish. All right. It's better. It's not brilliant yet. But the point was, it used to be absolutely awful to use. And lasting powers of attorney is something you do at a time of life when you're transferring assets. Maybe someone's died or something of that nature. You don't want to be learning a new stuff. It's solicitor backed. It's a lot of paper. We took about 80% of the paper out of it, made it a digital service, and made people's lives just that little bit easier at the time when they needed to deal with the state. Something interesting happened when we created a beautiful or more beautiful service and when we put the user needs first. Our colleagues up in Birmingham and Nottingham with whom we made this said, you've got to come back and add something. And we were like, mm, what is it now? And they said, you've got to add this button because people are calling us saying they really like it and that's never happened before. Like we've never had positive feedback. So the point about that button is that is one of the roots of democracy. It's the strength of democracy therein. Therein lies a tale of millions, hundreds of thousands of people getting a better service from the state using civic infrastructure that is beautiful and works for them. The third lesson is about this, and this is really the theme of your conference today, which is about making things open, making it better. Again, this is one of our design principles. And the thing that I reflect on in this job and what we're doing in the UK is not just to come here with an advert about what's happening in the UK, is we're doing our flavor of this, but this movement is happening all over the world. This is Anders Antip. This is he was until recently the Prime Minister of Estonia. And they've got an entire digital government. When you go to the cabinet table, they, they bring your own device if you're a cabinet minister, and you can have live interaction with voters and people in Estonia talking about policy at the same time. All the services are digital. The reason they did that, by the way, is that when the Russians left, they took all the infrastructure. 
So Estonia gave their infrastructure design, they had no money, to a bunch of open source engineers who designed one, and lo and behold, they made it beautiful. It's happening in different, yeah, give them a round of applause. It's a great place you'll get a chance to go. That's Estonia's version of what we're doing here, and it suits them. It's happening all over the world. This is 18F. This is in the US. They are, I think, taking a little bit of the learning of GDS and starting to create a bunch of people in the middle of the US system, which is obviously full of gridlock at the moment, and start to create these sorts of services there. It's happening in Argentina, in Mexico, all over the world, in Thailand, Taiwan particularly. And what we're seeing is a movement around openness that has got different characters and flavors depending on the country and depending on the political and governmental system. But many of those characteristics are common. A recognition that sharing makes stuff stronger. When we launched gov.uk, we did it because we did it in the way that we thought was the right way to do it. We were open, our codes on GitHub, etc., stuff like that. But what happened was a great thing is other countries continue to take it, fork it, use it. You know, this is, uh, this is our alpha up at the top left. And, you know, Honolulu government took it and used it. They actually used some of the content, I don't quite know why. Um, this is New Zealand government, an early version of their site taking it as well. And that's how it should be. Because as governments, we have to be open with each other and we are all facing the common problems. So opening up government infrastructure and data and services as common pieces of software is and has to be the movement of the next era of digital government. It is software as a public service. It's not necessarily ours or yours or mine. It belongs to all of us because all of us paid for it at the end of the day. So this is why we have stuff on GitHub. These are some of our other assets. This is gov.uk. Um, this is where all our data is open. This is a screenshot, obviously, because I'm presenting today. But if you go to gov.uk forward slash performance right now, and if anybody went to actually the tax this site or transport, they could probably shout out the number of live users transacting with government right now. It's all on there. We should just publish that data and have that data open as part of doing business. It is, after all, our data. Crucially, these platforms, whether they are performance or publishing in terms of GovUK or transactional or identity, are there to be built upon. They're there to pick up one of these dashboards and in one click you can use it too. And I'm delighted every day when I come into work and people wherever they are in the UK, in our public system or anywhere around the world start to use our systems and our software. Hello love. My daughter's just walked in. Hello. So you can find the tools for, for doing all this in the open. Because it's not just a matter about publishing them in the open, it's about tooling in the open. It's about moving things and putting them into the open so they can be used and built upon. And increasingly, all the tooling that we have in government is in the open as well. I'm going to leave you with some assets and some of our stuff. These are our design principles. This is the place that we start. We've synthesized all our working principles down to these and it's a, it's a work of art to get them down to such pithy statements we start there we put everything in a service design manual literally everything is on a browser i was with a just before this meeting i was with one of our newer uh, technology colleagues in government who when you come to government it sort of hits you the breadth and depth of the place and he said well you know how do i get going where's all the stuff he didn't actually say where's the manual but it wasn't far off i was like don't worry, it's all on a browser. It's all there. And it's like, was that for me? He's like, no, it's for anyone. Anyone who cares to look. It's going to get better, and it's going to get richer and deeper, and it's part of a conversation. The same goes for how we deal with suppliers. This whole parlor game of very large procurement, which lock out most people, that's got to go. What we've got to do is have digital services like the G Cloud, where people can turn up, small companies, one, two, three, four people companies, can turn up and pitch for business and get some business using open standards, and they can compete against the biggest companies in the world. That's how it should be. We should be easy to deal with. We can only do that if the, how you deal with us, the tooling of dealing with government, is wide open. Monitoring activity, seeing what you are doing, but seeing what everybody else is doing seeing what's working, and then rolling that back into our services. That is crucial. And finally, doing things like this, but a bit more elegantly, our blogging platform. 
you know, it's not exactly rocket science, but giving everybody in government the ability to talk to people using a platform. And so when we open new digital services and have new digital skills, as we did last week in Newcastle, we should be talking about that. And we should be talking about how the problems and the issues and the successes of how we develop digital government. Because without that conversation, we're doing it in isolation. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of these URLs, a couple of these places to go. That's where all our stuff is. And what underpins everything that we do is an idea that we're moving towards a government that is effectively a government of software. That should not be a contentious thing to say. Most organizations all over the world are doing the same. But we're doing it in a way that that software is open and it is bi-directional and there's a conversation. Because the ethos of public service that our assets, that our infrastructure is common and is public, we should not lose that on this journey. Our software should be exactly the same, which is why it's open. That's why I salute services like Wikipedia, because they've pioneered the way for us, and it's a model for us to follow, because if anything, we want a conversation. With that, I, and on that note, I will shut up and use the last few minutes of this talk, if at all possible, to take any questions. Thanks very much.